Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon or good morning to you, whether you are on the East Coast or the West Coast or somewhere in the middle. We're very happy that you could join us for this Healthy Watersheds Consortium webinar. For anyone who may not be familiar with the Healthy Watersheds Consortium, just a reminder, it is a partnership between the EPA, the NRCS, and the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, all working together to accelerate the protection of watersheds that are still in relatively good condition before they require extensive and expensive restoration. We provide competitive grants to help build capacity and catalyze the protection of thousands of acres of watershed land through projects involving land conservation, stewardship, policy, finance, as well as engaging communities and water providers. You'll hear more about several of these tools in today's presentation. I want to give special thanks to our federal partners, to the EPA's Office of Wetlands, Oceans, and Watersheds for their leadership in conceiving the program and getting it off the ground, and to the Natural Resources Conservation Service within the USDA for joining us and being a partner for the last three years. We really appreciate their support, their guidance, and their recommendations, and have sincerely enjoyed our partnership with both agencies over the past several years. And it's with great pleasure that I now get to introduce to you today's speaker, Lori Weyburn. Lori is the co-founder, co-CEO, and president of Pacific Forest Trust. Since 1993, she and her colleagues have been working to advance the sustainable management of forests in California, including the critical role they play in providing clean water. In making a grant to Pacific Forest Trust in 2016, the Healthy Watersheds Program was particularly impressed with the large vision and the ambitious protection goals Lori and her team developed for watersheds in California and how public policy and finance and protection and stewardship could all come together to make that vision a reality. We're really happy to host this webinar to share their progress on this journey and hope that it may inspire those of you working in other states on watershed protection initiatives. We look forward to your questions and discussion after the presentation. Welcome, Lori. It's great to have you here. Thank you for your inspiring work. And I'll turn it over to you. The microphone is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks to you, Jeff, and to Peter and Camille at the Endowment for the opportunity to talk with everyone today. Um, and thank you for the essential role that you really are playing uh, across the country in promoting the whole understanding of the role of natural infrastructure in water and also in a related area of climate change. Uh, so our project with the endowment and with the Healthy Watersheds Consortium is called Healthy Watersheds California. Uh, and it's really about promoting water security in California in this era of climate change in a way that built infrastructure and built storage projects just simply cannot. And uh, my organization, the Pacific Forest Trust, has a mission of promoting the protection of forests actually across America through our work as both a think and do tank. Uh, so our policy work is actually national and our on the ground work in conservation is in California, Oregon, and Washington. And part of what we do is act as a land trust for managed forests. Uh, we own forest land, we manage forest land, including cutting trees uh, in various sizes and selling them both as lumber and chip and saw and so on. And then we uh, hold conservation easements as well. Our focus really is to complement the traditional sources of income for landowners who have forest lands, which has been timber, and to complement that with financial return for the other services that forests provide, but have always been taken for granted. And one, of course, is their value for wildlife habitat. And really our work in developing conservation easements for managed forest lands that manage for habitat has been a major way to do that. Our work in the climate policy sphere, getting forests included within what is currently, but I hope not for long, the only statewide uh, climate policy, uh, economy-wide state policy on climate, uh, building an economy around the carbon sequestration values and climate mitigation values of forests, which has led to uh, 
over 7 million acres in 29 states in the U.S. being uh, conserved and managed for their climate values, and then also for its water services. And that is really the focus of our conversation today. But the only thing that I would like to note here is that these things all fit together. They're not siloed commodity approaches, one for the other uh, in a trade-off context. Our focus is really how can we work these things together for synergistic outcomes. So California, you all know it's a big state. It's a complicated state. It probably has the most sophisticated and complicated water delivery system in the world. It's piped from top to bottom to take water from the north part of the state where water is captured and transport it 600 miles down to the bottom part of the state. And the region of California that uh, this water comes from is called the Klamath Cascade because it's the intersection of the Klamath Mountains, the Cascades, and then the Northern Sierra. But it's heavily focused on the uh, Southern Cascades and Klamath region. This is 60% of the irrigated agricultural water for the state. It's 80 to 85% of the fresh water into San Francisco Bay. It's 45% or more, and sometimes a little less, of Los Angeles' water, depending upon the year, and at least 20% of San Diego's drinking water. Overall, it provides drinking water for 28 million people. And yet, given the geographic spread here, the people who drink the water really have no idea where it comes from. Uh, certainly, they know it comes from the tap. They may be aware of the canals that deliver it, and they may be aware of dams, but they really have very little idea indeed as to where the water originates. And in our work, our goal was to change that set of understandings for people and from that build a system that would help pay for this integral part of California's water infrastructure. And within this, it's important to recognize that um, while there are many, many challenges in providing cool, clean water for uh, the state's inhabitants and clean water for agriculture, uh, the understanding of what the problems were in terms of watersheds was very minimal when we began this. Uh, and there was very little understanding that watershed health actually threatened supply. To the degree that there is uh, policy in the state and financing when we began this project, it focused entirely on the built infrastructure, how to fund and maintain built infrastructure. And funding for watershed conservation and restoration followed a theory that we like to call the sprinkle trust, which is if there was a little bit of money around and there was high political attention to a particular area, there might be a little bit of money for that. And the contrast between that and how we looked at built infrastructure was really, really stark. So our Healthy Watersheds California program put forward this notion that we should conceive of watersheds as infrastructure and we should take the kind of financing that we have for built infrastructure and address that to the challenges in the natural water infrastructure realm. So this is where we began our work with the consortium and with the endowment in helping advance what you might call policy, which is to say it was a uh, piece of legislation that was proposed, passed, and signed into law, AB 2480, but really, it was a tool to get people to understand things. And what it did, AB 2480, was incorporate the concept of natural Im infrastructure into California's water system. So as I mentioned earlier, California has a very complex water system. It is state-driven, and state law drives its financing. Uh, when you're looking at the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project, the two big water delivery uh, vehicles in the state, they're part of that state water system. And the reason that we focused on that is that in California, if you wish to raise money within a local water agency, you have a proposition, a statewide proposition you have to deal with that mandates a two-thirds vote 
for the ratepayers to incorporate any change into that system. And at the state level, we have a proposition, Proposition 26, that also requires a statewide vote for any new tax. However, within the water system, uh, funds raised there are considered to be fees, so they don't require that same uh, financing uh, approach of a two-thirds vote. And you could address 28 million Californians at once as opposed to working through a series of small water agencies one by one by one, which would uh, require an enormous uh, degree of fu funding and effort at the ground level. So AB 2480 was targeted at the state's water system in order to address this in one approach as opposed to in hundreds of approaches. And as I say, what it did was incorporate watersheds into the infrastructure of the water system and therefore also allow access to the same kind of financing systems, which in the case of California, the financing for the water system is done to some degree through state grants, to some degree through general obligation bonds, but most importantly, and the target for our work, it also utilizes revenue bonds. And a key reason why we were looking at revenue bonds as a tool here is that uh, this is much cheaper money than general obligation bonds. In the state of California, it's estimated that it takes between seven and $11 to spend every dollar of general obligation funding that is raised. And at the time that we did this, California was dealing with a significant debt. Um, and so revenue bonds were a much uh, more likely source of funding than general obligation. And then following that, we um, took the effort to pass another piece of legislation, uh, AB 2551, that's identified here. And I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. But it fundamentally, it was a policy tool to enable the kind of comprehensive planning that you have to undergo if you're doing a big infrastructure project. And to be able to move that planning for watershed restoration up to the scale of the issues that we have here, which cover about 7 million acres. So these are two policy tools that we put in place to support a new approach to financing the scale of work that was needed here. And our goal within all this was to enhance the water security and the water quantity for California as we are increasingly experiencing the wild swings of climate change in terms of both drought and uh, floods and fire. So from a graphic perspective, this is the uh, flood of 2016 breaking through the dam at Oroville, a key holding facility for the state water project. To date, that's cost over $1.5 billion to address, and they estimate it'll cost at least another half billion dollars to fully address, and that's not counting the cost of the disaster itself in terms of having to move the people downstream or repair the hydropower pump that uh, one of the beneficiaries of the dam, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, had completely damaged within the flood. And then, of course, uh, though it may be old memory to people in the course of this year's winter, um, California is, has these increasing periods of drought. And um, this was the Shasta Reservoir, which is uh, central to the Federal Central Valley Project also part of California's water system at the height of California's recent droughts. And then you may all be familiar with the fires that have uh, hit California and other parts of the West with great intensity in these last years as we are dealing with the degraded conditions of these watersheds. And the fires in 2017 and 2018 in the region of these watersheds alone has cost a couple of billion dollars to address before we even begin to count the uh, insurance liabilities that are associated with it that are in the tens of billions of dollars. So the very, very direct impacts of having these watersheds in poor condition that by restoring them, we can actually address in a pretty synergistic and very cost-effective fashion. So let's talk about the five watersheds that feed the core of the state water system. 
And this is a uh, depiction of the roughly 7 million acres that are encompassed here. And what strikes you right away is not simply scale, but the diversity of ownership. Um, it's roughly 62% federally uh, managed and owned on behalf of the public, largely with the Forest Service, but also with the BLM and a little bit of the National Park Service. And 38% of it is privately owned and managed. Now, in that 38% is the timber basket of California. This is where almost three quarters of the so-called timber production zone or most productive forest lands in the state are. And it has a pretty intact um, social, economic, and cultural infrastructure for forest management as a result. And that's an important piece of what we're looking at within this uh, project in terms of engaging the people who manage forests and supporting their work in restoration just as much as for commercial return as well. So the five key watersheds, which uh, are here identified as now part of a state system, and I think that's a really important element here, was to have the state acknowledge officially that these watersheds, despite their varied ownerships, really need to be looked at as a whole and not in all their little component parts. We want to recognize the component parts and work respectfully with those in terms of their ownership and those ownerships needs, but we also need to weave it into a more coherent approach. And that is a key element that uh, we seek to do, which is not simply physical. It not, it's not simply about how we manage forests across ownership. It's also cultural. Um, I want to underscore why this region is so important, not simply because of issues today, but of how things are changing within the state due to climate change. And this uh, graphic here identifies how over the past century this region uh, experienced it. It stayed cooler and wetter over the past 100 years in the 20th century. Uh, and so it was the, you know, the dam builders had a good idea about where they built their dams. That's where the most of the water was. But it's really, really important when we look to the future. So as California warms and dries over the next 100 years, and these are, this is modeling done uh, looking at the different ends of the spectrum of uh, how intense climate change will be, uh, in terms of the water production capacity of the state. This slide here is about recharge. And um, California pumps a lot of water from its aquifers. Its single biggest aquifer is right in the middle of this region of these watersheds. And so that's the Pitt River. And the Pitt River, while not known as well as the Sacramento River for uh, those who know about California, but it is about 80% of the capacity of the Sacramento River. So if you took away the Pitt, the Sacramento River would diminish enormously. So this recharge issue here is really, really important over the next 100 years. And another example of this, and you can see here in this modeling the outline of the watersheds. And the reason there are more lines in it is that the Feather River has three branches. And so it's shown as a three part here. Um, this shows you simply that, again, that cooler and wetter will lead to a more recognizable um, future for this region. The habitats and the functions that are there today will still be there in the future. So what do we want to do in terms of being able to um, restore these watersheds to a more healthy, resilient, and productive state. Well, one is to restore more water and carbon-rich forests. So in the picture on the left, you see a fairly typical, even-aged, closed canopy forest. And on the right, you see a more diversified structure and um, composition of forest. The challenge with the forests on the left is that 
snow tends to accumulate in the top of those when they're above the snow line, and you lose a lot of that snow to evapor evaporation. And there are some studies that show that you lose up to 70% of that snow in the course of that. The other thing is that with an even canopy, and this is something for those of you who like to hike on a cloudy day or a foggy day, when you have an even canopy, when the mist blows over that canopy, it just goes in one direction. Whereas as you can see in the slide on the uh, right, where you have a mixed canopy, it creates a lot of turbulence. And that means that the trees can actually milk a lot more moisture out of that mist than otherwise. And in some ecosystems, that can add another 20 plus percent of the total pre precipitation for the area. So restoring a more natural structure to these forests actually has a very significant impact uh, in terms of the capture of moisture from the snow in other words, allowing the snow to filter down into the trees as opposed to hanging on the top of them and go onto the ground underneath and be held there for longer periods of time. And then also in terms of just milking precipitation out. So this is one area that is specifically mentioned in AB 2480 that we want to support the restoration of these forests uh, to this more natural state, which is more productive for water and to find a way to pay for that so that it's not simply a landowner cost. Now, a second solution that it's particularly flagged in this policy is around restoring our degraded stream channels. Um, in the Wayback Machine of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, when a lot of these lands were being used for ranching and farming, uh, it was the best science to channelize rivers and try and get water off of meadows as quickly as possible so that you could have more time either for grazing or for agriculture. And then as more ecological research came to light, people realized that that was really not the best idea and that what we needed to do was restore those uh, channels and that would actually help slow flooding and improve groundwater uh, retention as well. Another category is related to that, and that is restoring wet meadows in the large. And so not just in the stream channel area, but also in terms of the extent of these meadows. And um, one of the downsides of fire suppression over the past uh, 75 years, and we've been very successful in that, is that in these regions, the meadows had been maintained by uh, burning. And with fire suppression, conifer trees have encroached very significantly onto the meadow areas. And that's just in the words of Malcolm North, who's a well-known forest ecology, ecologist, putting too many straws in the ground. And so sucking water out. So not only were we flushing water out of these uh, meadows too quickly by straightening stream channels, but we were taking more water out by having this encroachment of trees that had not been there in the past. Um, and one of the kind of fun things in, in this slide is that in the course of restoring this particular wet meadow, they took a lot of the trees that they were removing from it and they used them to stabilize the banks and it's been highly successful. You can see in the lower uh, left uh, side there the outcome of the restoration um, on the same stretch of the stream that you see right up above it. And another area that is focused on within this new policy is uh, looking at reducing sediment delivery, particularly into uh, reservoirs, which diminishes their capacity. And what you see in the slide on the left is a shovel uh, measurement of sediment that was um, deposited right after the disastrous rim fire in California. And on the right, what you see is degraded uh, stream bed channels from grazing. So one of the key areas looked at in trying to enhance uh, watershed function is both to reduce fire and also to uh, manage uh, cattle grazing more effectively. So. Well, I was mentioning earlier about how the landscape is broken up into multiple ownerships. And so what you see on the left is a classic map 
of the ownerships uh, just off to the side of I-5, Interstate 5, that goes north and south in California, outside of the town of Dunsmuir, the green being public lands, public ownership, and the white being private. And then the aerial image to the side shows what that looks like on the ground. And it just illustrates this highly fragmented management approach, which diminishes the function of these forests as effective watersheds. And so coming up with ways to work across those ownerships is a key part of this. And effectively, that helps us manage the watershed as a whole. What you see here is on the side of the um, Oroville Dam, it is fragmentation and development. And this is something which um, we seek to provide competitive economic return for landowners to keep their land as forests. One of the challenges for these watershed ownerships if they are in the timber business is they follow a system called mark to market. Every year they look at their real estate holdings and they bring them up to the market values. And then uh, following a prudent financial management uh, approach, they put those with the highest real estate value on the market in order to enhance their economic returns. So one of the key goals within this Healthy Watersheds California is to develop through that financing that I was mentioning earlier on, the kind of competitive uh, funds to be able to buy conservation easements on these to dedicate them to remain in well-managed watersheds. So the outcome of doing all of these things, our goal is to promote resiliency in these watersheds. And this is just a uh, visual representation of what happened within one of the key tributaries to the McLeod River, which is one of the five rivers that feeds into these wa uh, the water system. Uh, there was a very significant fire in 2012, uh, leading to significant sedimentation and turbidity um, in uh, one portion of it. And in another portion where they had done um, fuels management thinning and then a prescribed fire, you can see the outcome in that stretch where there was not the turbidity and the stream really bounced back in the next year. So that's what we're seeking to promote is that kind of resilient watershed function through doing these non-commercial activities. Um, and this slide here is focused on just describing what those do and their impact in terms of their water benefits uh, when we do that. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the scale of this is pretty significant. So this is the um, Feather River watershed, uh, a little over 3 million acres. And you can see the reservoir itself down at the bottom of the slide. And then you see the extent of the watershed. And Changing people's perception of what we needed to do in order to fill that reservoir regularly um, has been an extremely interesting and frankly quite productive process uh, uh, as part of Healthy Watersheds California. And looking at this as a kind of top to bottom approach of what do we need to do so that we aren't putting a lot of money into a single project, but only realizing a little bit of its benefits. And so what we are, um, a next step that we took under uh, the Healthy Watersheds California project was to scope. Well, what really needs to be done? And this is not uh, a fine scale scoping, but a uh, kind of 30,000 foot level assessment that we produced uh, doing a uh, GIS-based analysis um, with publicly available data, unless individual landowners gave us data, uh, to assess the condition. So how many acres within these 7 million needed attention in terms of reducing the vegetation, either through mechanical treatments or prescribed fire or both? Uh, and what was the acreage of meadow restoration that needed to be done in terms of both wet and dry meadows? Because there are very different approaches and costs to each. What do we need to do in terms of livestock management? Uh, what kind of work needed to be done with roads and, in fact, trails as well? And how much of the uh, area uh, 
which is privately owned, should we target to try and conserve forever as well-managed forests? So this gives you a sense of the scale of work that we um, believe needs to be done to bring these into uh, a really resilient condition that can be re relied on for water security purposes in the state. And just to give you a sense of what the analysis was that we did within this, um, we did it in each of the categories that were identified and across each of the watersheds. So this is for the McLeod watershed, which is uh, relatively handleable at a little over 400,000 acres. What needed to be done here in terms of uh, vegetation management and reintroduction of fire? Um, then here within the Upper Trinity, which feeds into the uh, Shasta and is a highly uh, erodible uh, geology, what needed to be done from the roads so that we could have a sense of road miles. Um, within the pit, which uh, is this extraordinarily important groundwater recharge area for the state, as well as uh, so productive for water overall, uh, this is illustrative of the wet and dry meadow work that needs to be done. And we have maps for all of these uh, across uh, the watersheds in each of the categories. And then this is a sense of what it is for the Feather River. And you get a sense here of just how much work um, does need to be done. And you could either look at that and say, well, this is really overwhelming. Or you could look at that and say, that's a lot of jobs. Um, and then here is the Upper Sacramento, again, a relatively small uh, watershed in the scale of these things. And this is just looking at what would need to be done in terms of conservation easements within this. Um, and the interesting thing here is that uh, a lot of progress has actually been made in terms of working with these landowners around conservation easements. And we can show that there's a very receptive audience to that when funds are available to do that. So overall, we made an estimate that this would cost an additional $4 billion. Uh, and many people go, oh my goodness, how could you ever get $4 billion for doing this kind of conservation work? That's not, you know, we don't think in those terms. Uh, but you may remember in the first part of this uh, discussion how much money we have been spending to deal with the downsides of the current condition. We're already spending over $4 billion to deal with negative effects. And so in fact, if we proactively invest this, we're going to be following the same example that we've seen in other natural infrastructure approaches around water. And this, of course, is the very well-known uh, case of New York City, where when they faced another water infrastructure issue, uh, though this one was dealing with water quality, and was under a regulatory uh, requirement, they were either looking at $8 billion in new water facilities on the built side or $1.5 billion on the natural side. And it's been a highly successful um, approach on the natural infrastructure side, and they have not yet spent even all $1.5 billion that they uh, identified the authority to use. So in the case of our um, California context, uh, a comparable kinds of savings are available. And I wanted to just give you a, a sense of that breaking out of the whole uh, of the watersheds and focusing in simply on those for the Shasta or Central uh, Valley Project Reservoirs. Um, and this is, uh, the Shasta is actually the deepest reservoir in the country. And some of you may know that there's a proposal to raise the dam in order to create more water security for some of the beneficiaries of the Central Valley Project. Um, and so this is just a comparison of um, what would happen if you took the same amount of money and applied it to the natural infrastructure work that could be done within the uh, Shasta watersheds. And one of the most interesting things is that while raising a dam can indeed hold more water when there is more water to be had, so in the non-drought years, the work in the natural infrastructure actually increases the total inflow to that reservoir. So 
that what you're doing is actually effectively creating more water. And so when we were talking in the beginning about the work that needed to be done in terms of vegetation management, both in forests and in meadows, a big part of that is simply removing some of the straws in the ground, and that yields more water uh, in terms of what is being evapotranspired up into the atmosphere, as well as capturing more. Um, and you also get very significant flood protection benefits. You have benefits of reducing fire risk. You create 33,717 job years, so a lot more than what you do in raising a dam, and that money stays in these rural regions. Uh, tremendous benefits for fish, which is one of the key areas that um, the Shasta Dam Raise is actually supposed to do, but the Fish and Wildlife Service has identified it won't. Uh, so net-net, it might not be that one only wants one solution, and usually you have to have several. But the, what this kind of comparison shows is that raising a dam alone will not create the outcomes that we want, particularly in a climate-challenged state like California. So one of the things that we wanted to point out in uh, this work is that there are very clear beneficiaries legally defined in California of the water system. So the water system beneficiaries are the water contractors, which are kind of water middlemen within the state, and hydropower producers. And what you see with this slide, which was done as of 2017, and we need to update the analysis here because 2018's costs uh, were were substantially higher. Um, in 2018, in the massive fire year, four of the so-called five mega fires were in this region alone. So, uh, but what you see here is that on average, averaged out over 10-year uh, cost periods, the only entities paying for these watershed benefits are the private landowners and the taxpayer. And Yet the beneficiaries are the recipients of this water and the power. So the $4 billion that I've talked about as being an additional amount to raise to put those watersheds into much more functional condition, we believe that there should be a fair beneficiary pays system towards that. And there should be a contribution in by those beneficiaries uh, in backing revenue bonds for this. And uh, what we have been working with in the water world through the Association of California Water Agencies, or ACWA, and then individual members of that, is raising this concept of a fair beneficiary pay system, which um, is something that they have endorsed publicly, and opening the discussion about what does that mean? What is fair? And if we're looking at this level of investment needed over the next 10 years, which would translate to about $400 million more. So this 246 that's currently being paid uh, and adding 400 to it, with something like $200 million a year spread out across all the water agencies and hydropower be fair. So would, for example, a third of the cost be fair? And that, you know, we don't have an answer to that, but we have raised that question, and it is a question that's being raised also within the policy context, because um, as California is grappling with some of these really significant uh, climate exacerbated disasters in these watersheds, there's a recognition that we need to employ uh, new and innovative financing to addressing the problems. So um, we like to think of this approach as a win-win-win-win solution because it certainly benefits our dogs that we walk in the park in Southern California and it benefits the wildlife that is threatened and endangered in this region. It certainly has employment benefits and sustainable econo benefit, economy benefits in rural Northern California and most people don't realize it but several of the counties in rural Northern California remain highly economically depressed and have some of the highest unemployment in the country and obviously it has benefits for water. Um, I also wanted to just point out as we are closing the uh, kind of lecture portion of this, um, 
is the relationship of this work to climate change. And um, as we look at the increasingly evident climate exacerbated, if not driven, catastrophes across this country and the world, and we look at the very clear science out of the National Academy of Sciences, as well as the United Nations uh, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. When you look at these emissions curves, which are designed to model what is happening as we increase our CO2 emissions, and we actually are well beyond the blue line, which is the worst scenario, there's only one line there, that green line, that leads us to a recognizable future for our children where they have habitats that are similar to what we see in the world and livelihoods and ecosystem function that's comparable. And that is the line that's achieved by working with natural and working lands. And both the, Academy, the National Academy of Sciences and the, you know, the IPCC identify that at least another 37% of our emissions reductions have to come from working with land. So the kind of work that we're doing in these watersheds is the kind of work that helps us get to that green line. And I think that when you look at what we can do through this Healthy Watersheds California project, the outcome that we'd like to see on the ground is that we have secured and restored 75 to 85% of these watersheds. And that number is based on the kind of minimum number of the watershed that we need to have healthy watershed function. And in turn, that gives us water security and it gives us more climate resilient water supplies in the face of that. It contributes significantly to this issue of removing CO2, restoring forests that uh, are ones that we can stand in awe of. And I think that it shows intrinsically that forests are systems. Forests are not simply a place where commodities are drawn from, but that multiple commodities and services are drawn from, and that we need to be evolving our policies, our finances, and our culture to be able to support that so that forests, in turn, can support us. And with that, I'd like to stop talking and hear your questions. If you have any questions, make sure to type them in the chat function below. Okay, it looks like our first question is from Elliot, um, and he asks, will this presentation be available to download? And yes, this presentation will be available on the U.S. Endowment YouTube page in the next few days. Our next question is from Peter Stengel, um, and he asks, Lori, how many staff do you have at PFT? How many folks were engaged in this process? Lori? Can you hear me? Uh, so hear Peter's now. question about how many staff are at PFT. The uh, staff at PFT are 16. Um, those that are engaged in this project um, also include some consultants, but um, it's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, five people have been primarily involved in this, and then uh, several consultants as well. 
Um, in terms of staff for this, we have one dedicated staff person uh, for this, and then uh, a number of us work on it uh, as a portion of our jobs as well. Okay, great. Our next question is from Alex, and they ask, how are you financing the forest restoration work to take advantage of the multiple private beneficiaries? So what we have um, put together as a proposal around this is financing the work um, in the same kind of three-part um, financing as is used for the built infrastructure. So that's state grants, and largely those are driven from the um, auction of pollution allowances under California's climate policy. And then um, general obligation bonds, such as the water bond, um, and um, there's now a climate adaptation bond that is being proposed and then a portion, the roughly $2 billion that we are suggesting come from revenue bonds backed by payments from the water contractors and from the hydropower side. And that is the portion that I was just discussing at the end there that we have raised as a, um, a formal discussion with members of the water agency and then also with the uh, state administration, which eventually is the group that will decide on that. So the private beneficiaries, there are only those two categories of private beneficiaries, and those are the water contractors and the hydropower producers, which is really only the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Um, and then the multiple beneficiaries who are private are either paying directly already, i.e. the private landowners paying for their portion of the watershed management, and then taxpayers. So that's where the larger uh, suite of beneficiaries are addressed. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Peter. Um, he asks, Lori, you've been at this for several years now. If you had known at the start what you know now, would you do anything differently? If other organizations wanted to undertake something like this, how would you suggest they begin? Well, that's a great question. Um, I'll take the latter part first. Um, I think what's important is to know how the water in your state is um, administered effectively. Uh, because California has some unique context to it with that state water system, it made sense within this context to work at the state level. Um, but at the um, local water agency level, it might be a, a different approach. I think several things that have changed since we began this project is that um, the General Accounting Standards Board, or GASB, has um, made a new finding that uh, watersheds can be counted as assets, which I think is a really important element uh, within how water uh, agencies work. And so what I would suggest uh, starting now rather than when we started in 2014, 2015, is that there are some tools available at the national level through GASB that um, are useful in working at integrating watershed infrastructure work along with other obligations of water agencies. The other thing that I would really um, advocate is spending time understanding water agency culture and how general managers think. Um, and because they have so many problems they have to address all the time with their existing context, having them understand that watersheds are part and parcel of what they need to take into account um, is something that takes uh, understanding of that world. And so we would have incorporated more of the water agency um, understanding right up front. And I think that's, a, that's a, a helpful construct to include within within your projects. 
This next question is from Karen. Uh, they ask, your data is about conservation and the Feather River watershed is outdated. How can uh, we from the Feather River Land Trust help you update that information? Well, actually, um, the scale at which that is, um, it's great to update on a regular basis. Um, the amount of conservation needed probably will change every year uh, due to the fact that there is work in all of these watersheds that is uh, being undertaken. So at the present time, the state is about to uh, launch a next phase of this work in developing a, a kind of action-ready implementation plan based on the scoping analysis that was done. And that's uh, assembling current information in all of these watersheds as to projects that are underway, projects that are planned to be underway, and projects that need to be underway. Uh, publicly available data is always several years behind uh, what direct action may be. And so whether it's on the federal lands or whether it's on private lands or whether it's within conserved acreages that land trusts manage, um, that will constantly need to be updated. So even by the time the implementation plan is done uh, by the end of 2021 or mid-2022, uh, there will always be a need to update that, and um, groups like Feather River Land Trust can really be helpful in ensuring that the state has that data and uploads it on geographic you know, and spatially explicit information. But it's really great that so much action is happening on the ground uh, on an annual basis for our you know, land trusts are very, very active in these general regions. Okay. Any final questions for Lori? Type them in the chat, please. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, Laurie, do you have any final remarks? Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And if folks have questions that they want to follow up with, please feel free to email me at the email that's identified there on the last slide. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Laurie, for presenting. And we hope everyone has a great rest of their day.